Well, this morning we have the privilege of starting a new sermon series together, which is simply titled, What is the Church? There's a lot of different, uh, different manners and mechanisms and methods, also a lot of madness that is involved in uh, preachers selecting sermon series and passages to preach through. I'm not going to say anything on all the different methods and ways to select a passage, except that, of course, the way that I use is the best. And other than that, I'll stay silent. But uh, we're going to be spending some time, the next seven or eight weeks or so, diving into this question, what is the church? Now, there's two, two basic ways to approach biblical preaching, that is, preaching from God's Word. Biblical preaching is, of course, taking God's Word and preaching it, making it known to God's people. It's taking God's Word and making it known to God's people. There's a couple of different ways to do that. There's, of course, lots of ways to do biblical preaching wrong. I'm sure many of us have had the privilege of, of hearing terrible, awful preaching that's not biblical. Oh, no, nobody's ever heard that. Okay, good, good. But there's a couple of ways to do biblical preaching, what we might say the right way. We might say the way how God has intended it, the way how we see observed in Scripture. So there's two, at least two different ways to preach biblically. One of them is to go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through a book of the Bible. Now we've most recently done this with our Esther series. We read through whole passages, we read through whole chapters, and then we went in and saw what was the truth that was there in God's Word, and then we sought to apply that to our life. That's called verse-by-verse verse or chapter-by-chapter chapter preaching. I am of the opinion that that should be the regular default mode for most churches. So, if you come back here in a year and you hear us going through a series like that, don't be shocked. Don't be shocked if that's like a regular thing that we do. But there's a second way to also preach through Scripture, to preach biblically, and that's called topical preaching. No, it's not about a cream. It's still biblical preaching. It's about taking God's Word or taking questions about God's Word or just taking general questions to God's Word to see what God's Word has to say. So those are those two big overarching ways to divide up preaching. You can preach verse by verse, or you can preach topically. I think verse by verse is probably the best default mode, but at this moment in our church, we've got a wonderful opportunity to tackle this topic, to ask this question together. What is the church? We're in kind of a unique setting. Has anything big happened over the last year and a half or so? Okay, maybe it's not so unique that it's never happened in the course of church history or in the course of human history, but the reality that COVID has changed a lot of our society and changed the way how we interact with one another and changed a lot about how our lives go on, give us a unique moment to ask this question, what is the church? About a year ago, a lot of us were asking, what is essential? Do you all remember having those conversations? Okay. So there are good questions that we might ask, and this, I think, is a good question. And this right now, in this moment, for better or for worse, is what we've prayerfully considered and then taken on to ask for the next seven or eight weeks. What is the church? This is a big question. It's a big topic. And so we're going to fail from the get-go unless we pray. So let's dive into God's Word together through prayer, and then let's dive in some more together through reading. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do ask that you would be at work in us through your word. For you have promised that your word goes out and bears fruit. God, would you allow us to bear fruit even this day as we hear from your word and as we consider the questions that surround us and that beset us, both as a group of your people, as a local body, but also questions which beset the greater body of your church throughout time and history and our brothers and sisters across the globe. Would you give me wisdom on what to say and what not to say? And would you give us wisdom 
to seek You and to seek Your Word about what it means, what it looks like, and what we ought to do as we are Your church. We pray all this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. So what is the church? So that's going to be our topic for the next couple of weeks. And we're going to dive into this a couple of different ways. There's, of course, the next question might be, well, what ways? What are the best ways to go about studying this question about what we know about the church? One way to do this might be to simply take a whole book of the Bible, like Acts. I mean, Acts is, is a historical record of the early church. So we could go in and dive through verse by verse and chapter by chapter. We could also just read a whole host of verses, take some statements that are prescriptive and descriptive about what a church is to be and what a church was, and then apply those. We're going to probably do a little bit of both. We're probably going to read some passages throughout the New Testament and take a look at them, do some of them under the microscope, as it were, focusing in on a passage here or there. And then sometimes we're also going to see a litany of passages or a plethora of passages or a lot, a lot of passages, depending on your verbiage. Well, I want to open our series by asking you a question about spaceships, as is appropriate. That's where we were all going. It's the next logical step. Some of you are awake still. <laughs> so if I were to ask you, what is a spaceship? If I were to ask you, what is a spaceship? There's a lot of different answers that you could give. Of course, we might all pull out our phones and start looking up on Wikipedia or pulling out our favorite YouTube app and, and looking up, well, what is a spaceship? We, we might, back in the day, we might go and reference an encyclopedia and see what it's got to say about a spaceship. We might also leave it to our imaginations. Well, a spaceship is a, is a ship that goes out on a five-year voyage to seek and explore strange new worlds. And it's got a wonderful crew of Scotty and Dr. McCoy and Captain Kirk. And they go off and they meet aliens. And they represent the United Federation of Planets. All right, there's like only two nerds in the audience and I'm one of them, but that's okay. If the, the, the point is, we could use our imagination to answer that question, what is a spaceship? We could use our imagination. We could use the imagination about Star Trek and come up with all of these wonderful answers from our imagination. We might answer about Star Wars. Maybe there's some of you who are bigger Star Wars fans than Star Trek fans. Either way, we could use our imagination to answer that question. But the reality is, if we use our imagination to answer this question, what is a spaceship? We're going to be far away from reality, right? So if we leave this question to our imagination, we're, we're not really going to be that helpful if we just leave things to our imagination. Well, we could, go to, we could go to the history books. We could say, well, what about things that have actually happened? Okay, well, what if we answer the question, what is a spaceship, by looking at the historical event of the Challenger explosion? We might look at that one single event and say, well, spaceships are very dangerous. Spaceships are risky. Space exploration costs people their lives. So whether or not we use our imagination, and then we're left in a spot where we don't actually have truth, or if we look at history, but if we just look at one individual piece of history, we won't really have that accurate of an answer to the question, what is a spaceship? If we just look at the Challenger explosion and we don't see it in the context of the Russian versus American space race, or the Apollo program, or the many other developments in space flight technology, then even though we're looking at a historical event, the Challenger explosion, we're still left wondering what is a spaceship? We've only got one instance of it, in other words. So too, for us, with this question about what is the church? If we just leave this question to our imagination, we are going to have a seriously messed up church. It will be far away from reality. Oh, it might have all sorts of good ideas in it and fun ideas, but it won't be what the church is meant to be. We could go with the historical approach. and We could just look at, let's say, one epistle 
And I think that is a good thing to do, and we probably will do that in the future. But for this series, I think if we just look at one epistle that's in the New Testament, that just looks at one church and its challenges and its problems, I think it'll be very similar to the mistake of just answering the question about a spaceship by looking at one historical event. It, it'll be devoid of context, and it really won't give us answers to help us shape what our church should be today. It would only give us a piece of the puzzle. A good piece, a helpful piece, but I think for this discussion and for this question, we need to go topical, we need to go broad, and we need to go to God's Word, not our imaginations and not just one instance, to see what is the church. So for those of you who like baseball, for those of you who take notes at home, you can bust out your pens, because today we're going to look at five things really quickly about what is the church. Five things. The first thing is that the church are God's people redeemed by Christ, saved by Christ. The second thing is that the church is saved from eternal penalty of sin. The third thing is that the church, the redeemed people of God, are saved from the present power of sin. The fourth thing is that the church is saved for the glory of God. And the fifth thing is that the church is saved for the work of God. So saved by Christ, saved from eternal penalty of sin, saved from present power of sin, and saved for the power, saved for the glory of God, and saved for the work of God. Well, first off, we start off saved by Christ. And without preaching an Easter sermon to you again, I'll just leave you with a few, a few verses. For this is indeed our foundation of our faith, that we have been saved by Christ. If you take this one reality away, this is why we're starting here. If you take this one reality away from what it means to be a church, if you take away the saved by Christ part of being a church, then you don't have a church. It's not a church. The church is the assembled, redeemed people of God who have been saved by Christ. If you take away that saved by Christ part, you just have a people who are gathering. People gather for all kinds of reasons. But God's people gather specifically because we've been saved by Christ. In Acts 2, verse 38, this is the midst of his sermon on Pentecost. Peter is preaching to thousands, and he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That Peter's central foundational call to action was belief in Christ, was submission and repentance to Christ. That if you take away the Jesus Christ part of the church, it is no longer the church of Jesus Christ. This isn't just a message that Peter preached. Oh, well, that's just Peter's way of presenting the gospel. That's just his, maybe that's just his preference. Maybe that's just his hobby horse. No, no, no. This is the central aspect of what makes a church a church. This is the central aspect of the apostles' teaching and witnessing of the gospel in Acts 16 31. There's a group preaching there who responds to the questions of those who ask, What must we do? Those teaching the gospel say, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. This isn't just Peter's message. It's not just a random message in the book of Acts. In Mark 16, 16, we're told, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Oh, well, maybe it's just, maybe it's just Peter and maybe it's just that one group in Acts and then maybe it's just Mark. All right, John, in John 1.12, he says, Yet to all who did receive Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Later on in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the central pillar. This is the foundation. This is the cement that is poured upon which everything else in the church stands. The church are the people of God redeemed by Christ Jesus. If you take that away, everything else falls apart. 
I think I said it last week, or maybe it was during Palm Sunday. If you take away our faith in Christ Jesus, His life, His death, His atonement, we can pack it up and go home. Go live however we want. This is our foundation. If you take this away, nothing else stands of our faith. But this does stand. This is the foundation of our faith. That we are the church, which is the redeemed people of God, saved by Christ. Well, what are we saved from? The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 6, 22 and 23, But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We've been saved from the eternal penalty of sin. That's what we've been saved from. Jesus said in John 8, 24, I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am the Christ and you will indeed die in your sins. There's only two ways to pay for sin. There's only two ways. It's your choice. It's not cash or credit. There's only two ways. It's your blood or it's Christ's blood. That's it. That's all God the Father accepts. For those who are redeemed in Christ Jesus, we've gone to Christ Jesus and pled, or pleaded, begged, or asked that it would not be on us that our sins would be laid, but that it would be laid on Him. And see, that's good news for those who are redeemed in Christ, because it means that we no longer bear the eternal penalty of our sins. You might ask, what's the, uh, what's the qualification list for eternal punishment? Nothing. Just do nothing. That's all you need to do to qualify for eternal punishment. You might say, well, Jacob, I, I have lots of friends who, who don't believe in Christ, but you know, they're fundamentally good people. They don't walk around and do this or do that. Christ Jesus, in His call to repent and have faith in Him. Have you ever thought of that? That's a command. It's not just like a helpful tool tip suggestion. It's not something that you write on the glass in case of emergency break. It's a command. So for all who do not repent and believe in Him, They're rebelling against that command. That means that the payment for, for sin will be on them unless they repent and come to Christ. Jesus said the way to hell is wide. It's wide. It's not much that we have to do. In fact, there's nothing that we have to do to be eligible for our own payment of our own sin. But for those who are redeemed in Christ Jesus, we have been redeemed through His blood. It is not our blood that will be demanded of by the Father for our sins, for it has all been paid on the cross. And boy, that's good news. For the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Such that for Christians, for the church, for those who are redeemed by Christ, they are saved from the eternal penalty of sin. Saved by Christ from the eternal penalty of sin. We've also been saved, the redeemed of God have also been saved from the present power of sin. Yes, there's this aspect of eternity, but there's also an aspect of the present. In 1 Peter 2, verses 24 through 25, we're told He Himself, that's Jesus, bore our sins in His body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. So you see, we've been, we've been saved from eternity, yes, but we've also been saved from, from a present enslavement, 
from a present dominion of sin. To quote again from Romans 6, but now that you have been set free from sin, we used to be in bondage. We used to be in shackles. We used to be in prison to sin. How many of y'all have got cell phones? Let's see who's awake. How many of y'all have got computers? All right. When things get really, really bad on your cell phone and your computer, there's something that you're told to do. But you're only told to do this if you really think it's really bad on your computer and your phone. I mean, it's got to be so bad. Because you'll go into your settings and you'll find that option that says restore to factory default. In that moment, you are prepared to kiss goodbye to anything and everything that you had on that computer or that cell phone. Everything else is dead to you. Because it will be gone once you click restore to factory default. Brothers and sisters, in our factory default, our factory default setting as human beings, prior to coming to faith in Christ, our factory default is rebellion against God and sin. This is what Paul means when he says in Romans 6 that we were slaves to sin. That its power held dominion over us. That our natural inclinations in all that we think and all that we do and all that we say is an affront to God. But that's not where the church is. Because the church has been freed from the power of present sin. Does that mean that the church is perfect? I'm not looking at any of you when I say this. No, it's not. Is the church perfect? No. Are the people in the church perfect? No. Is the Savior of the church perfect? Oh yeah. That's the good news. Because we're not perfect, we need one who is. We need one who can set us free from the shackles of sin, and He has for those who have faith in Him. Does that mean that sometimes sin doesn't tempt us anymore, or that we're free from temptation? Oh no, even Christ Jesus was tempted. So are we tempted? You betcha. Does that mean that sin has a power over us anymore? Is sin our default setting now? No, it's not. Oh, praise God. You mean to tell me that we who were once enemies with God can now do things that are pleasing to Him? Yeah. Boy, that's good news. James 4, 7 puts it this way. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Oh, resist the devil and he might take a hint? Is that what it says? Resist the devil and, and maybe he'll, he'll take your objection under consideration. No, it says resist and he will flee. Far too often in our lives, when sin and temptation comes along the way, we just go, well, I can't really resist. It might suffer if I resist. Oh, brothers and sisters, Christ Jesus suffered. He suffered to the point of death. And not just to death on a cross, but death bearing the penalty of your and my sins. I think we can suffer through some temptation, yeah? Not in my strength, not in your strength, in his strength. Oh, yeah. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. We can fight some temptation. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. That old way, that old default is gone. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. We've been made and saved from the eternal penalty of sin and from the present power of sin. Does that mean sometimes we'll still sin? Yep. But we repent then. You see, that's the fundamental difference between the church and those who do not have faith in Christ Jesus. We who are in the church, when we sin, we are to go to God in repentance and go to one another and ask for forgiveness. That is a fundamental difference 
between us and the world is that God has given us his power. Even as he has forgiven us, so too we may forgive one another. It is a really, really scary thing. I've said it before and I'll say it again. It is a really scary thing to pray. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's a really scary thing. We can ask for forgiveness of one another and ask for forgiveness from God because he has extended forgiveness to us through Christ Jesus. This is a hallmark of the Christian faith. That when we sin, we repent to God and we ask for forgiveness from one another. Well, not only have we been freed from the present power of sin, but we've been saved for something. We've been saved by Christ from the eternal penalty of sin and from the present power of sin. And we've been saved for the glory of God the Father. Jesus put it this way. He said in John 11.40, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? If you believe, you will see the glory of God. In Colossians 1.27, we're told, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you. This is a mystery, but it's a glorious mystery. That you have been saved for the glory of God the Father. You've been set apart for His glory. In 1 Corinthians 10.31, Paul writes, Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. So all that we do now is motivated and looks forward to the glory of God in what we do. That's our purpose in many ways to serve for the glory of God in our lives. Now at this point, I hope you've got some questions. And indeed, it is my hope throughout this series that our series of sermons on what is the church provokes some questions for you. I hope some of the truths that we cover from God's word stir up in you attention, whether it's a pit in your stomach or whether it's an awkwardness, or whether it's just a burning question in the back of your mind that you kind of raise your hand and then tentatively move it to the back. You ever, did you ever do that in school? Where the teacher's looking at you and you're like, no, I didn't have a question. I was just scratching the back of my head. I hope there are some questions that are burning in you and that will be burning in you over the next couple of weeks. Because when we read about the church and about God's plans for the church, about what the church is, it ought to make us question, well, what about our church? Well, brothers and sisters, it's not our church. It's his church. So what about his church? How are we caring for his church? How are we serving in his church? I've spoken with some churches that have bowling teams and bowling leagues. Where's Rosalie? There she is. I've spoken with some churches that have house repair and house building teams. Well, should our church, should our church do the bowling thing? Should we do the house building thing? Should we do the, the fishing and the getting together thing? The cooking and the barbecue thing? Should we do the evangelism street preaching thing? What, what should our church do? Well, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. I've known some churches who have those bowling leagues and they do it just for fun. You can go to a bowling alley for that. I know other churches that have bowling leagues and they do it for the explicit express purpose of building relationships with people who would never otherwise walk into their sanctuary or into their building. They do it for the glory of God. So should we have a bowling alley? There's ways to do it wrong. There's ways to do it right. Should we have a home building team? I know some who have a home building team and they think, well, this is good. We're improving, we're improving the life quality of people. I know other churches who have home building teams and they do it so that way they hope that they can cook a meal once the home is built and they can ask the people, can we come and eat a meal with you and share with you why it is that we've helped build this house for you? We'd like to tell you about our God. 
You see, it's, it's not about whether or not it's a bowling alley or a home building thing. It's about whatever it is that we're doing. Are we doing it for the glory of God? That's the question. Or at least one of the questions that we, I hope, have on our hearts and burning within us. That it's the glory of God that we have been saved for. That's the purpose. That's why he has saved us and redeemed us. He has done it for his glory. And he's also done it, fifthly, for good work. In Ephesians 1, 11 and 12, we're told, In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, or so that we, or therefore we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. We've been saved by Christ from the eternal penalty of sin from the present power of sin, for the glory of God the Father, and for the good works that God has prepared for us. So there's good work to do. There's good questions to ask. And I hope we can ask some of those questions in the coming weeks. I hope we can study together from God's Word next week to see how disagreements were handled in the early church and what that has to teach us in our church. Oh, we never have disagreements, do we, here in Bunker Hill? That must just be a Michigan or a Missouri thing. I hope in a few weeks we'll see what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I hope we'll see how the church was organized in the New Testament, whether there are any differences between our organization and the New Testament church, if that's a good thing, if that's not a good thing. And I hope we'll see what the goal of the church is. What is it that we've been established for? Why is it that God has redeemed us? And what should we be aiming for? I want to encourage you as we close this morning, this week, if you've been saved by Christ, then you have been saved from the eternal penalty of your sins. You've been saved from the present power of sin in your life. Resist the devil this week, brothers and sisters. Resist him and he will flee from you. You've been saved for the glory of God. There's a whole bunch of stuff that y'all have got planned for this week. And there's a whole bunch even more stuff that God has planned for you that you don't even have planned. Do it all for his glory this week. There's good work to do. So let's get to it.